exciting day today um, on Coffee with Dr. A. We have a good friend of mine, um, somebody that I've known for how long has it been now? Since 2007? 2006. Oh, so yeah, seven based on yeah. uh, when I came to visit. Yeah. Yeah. So since 2007, I've known this guy. We've worked together. Uh, Dr. Darshak Patel is um, a good friend of mine, and I am glad to have him on the episode today for Coffee with Dr. A. Do you have your coffee, by the way? Well, I was going to say thanks for inviting me, and I know it's coffee with Dr. Ray, but I don't drink coffee, so I've got my poison. Oh, it's look water. at you. Look at you. <laughs> well, well, thank you for being here. Uh, I could go into a really deep in- introduction about who you are, what you do, and all the amazing things that you're doing um, at the University of Kentucky and, and for the world. But what I want to do is, and I'm really interested in how different people do this. I want you to tell us, who are you? What should the world know about Darshak Patel? Let's go there. Wow, okay. I don't think I've ever had that kind of question before. So in short, uh, I'm a senior lecturer of economics at the University of Kentucky, but my journey has been pretty interesting. Um, Born and raised in Kenya. My parents moved to Kenya in the 70s. Uh, I did my kindergarten, my elementary, my high school in Kenya. I moved to Texas uh, for my college. Uh, I moved to University of Texas at Arlington and I majored in economics. I enjoyed it uh, quite a bit. Wasn't sure what I wanted to do with life. And my professor at that time, my mentor, Dr. Michael Ward, pushed me to do my master's and worked on a thesis. I really enjoyed working on a thesis and you know, answering some interesting questions and He went like, if you would like to pursue this, why not go get a PhD? And then I applied at University of Kentucky as one of my places. One of the other mentors, uh, Dr. Dennis Wilson, who's at Western Kentucky University, pushed me to apply at the University of Kentucky. And I'm glad I did because although during my visit, which you and uh, a fellow colleague Aziz uh, took me out for lunch and showed me around, I was a little bit unsure about Lexington, Kentucky, living in big cities all my life. Uh, Glad I made that move, Uh, Mm -hmm. made some good friends, made some great colleagues. And then um, when I graduated, I graduated with my PhD around 2011, went for a year to teach at Rona College, and then taught three years at University of Tennessee Martin until uh, University of Kentucky came calling and asked if I want to come back. And it was one of like, a dream job that I could not say no to. So in short, that's my professional lifestyle. Yeah. So so there's a lot of things that uh, you and I have in in common, and uh, it's probably why we are uh, good friends. But the the international student perspective, um, you know, I too, right after my undergrad, went straight into into a master's. Um, So I'm really interested in knowing everything that you know now and looking back at your life, is there something about your education that you would have done differently? Lots. I could have done a lot differently. And it's always uh, the vision 2020, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. So I came in as a very shy student. It was very difficult for me to speak up in large crowds. It was very difficult for me to approach a teacher. Uh, I would try and solve problems on my own. If I couldn't solve those problems, I would just hide. I wouldn't, mm-hmm. wouldn't do anything about it. I wouldn't reach out for help. And I think that's something that we need to push our students for uh, motivating themselves to do that, right? I think yeah. international student or uh, a local student, I think they all struggle coming into their first year of college, uh, figuring out what they want to do in life, uh, how they're going to approach it and so on. They're always struggling. There's this, yeah. uh, there's this uncertainty. So I think we all went through that same uncertainty. You did at University of Louisville. I did at University of Texas Arlington. What would have helped was if I had a mentor or if I could figure out how to go to a professor and ask them to mentor me from the beginning or from the start, I think that would have played a big role in my life. Uh, I felt like I figured out what I wanted to do, but it took me a while to get there. And for international students, with the current environment and climate, there's already a lot of uncertainty. And so they're already coming with this increased anxiety. And to help reduce that, I feel like getting some form of support system. And in the beginning, that support system could come from joining a student organization. 
such as uh, Economic Society in our case, or the Indus International Student Organization, but also having that higher order, reaching out to a faculty member who could guide you to make the correct steps, uh, that would be helpful as well. The, the, those are really great points. And this is advice that I've given um, international students as well. Uh, one of my biggest concerns, and this is something that, you know, I had a conversation with an international student once, and I said, you know, I'm, there's all these things that are available to you. I announce all of these um, opportunities in, in, in my classes. How, why do you not take advantage of it? And, you know, for other of our colleagues out there that are watching this, you know, this is a common question. How do we get international students ingrained into our academic uh, environment a little bit more? And the student responded to me and said, you know, I come from a culture that if you tell me once, you're just informing me. If you tell me twice, then you're encouraging me. If you tell me three times, then you really want me there. So they're asking for multiple engagements, right? And as educators, we say it once and we assume that that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, but, but now I'm on the other side and I'm looking at what um, students um, should be doing, but I'm also asking myself, what can I be doing? So what advice do you have for faculty members as they navigate the conversation with international students to help them feel more welcome and more ingrained in today's academic environment? Oh, that's interesting. That's, uh, that's something I haven't heard. And uh, it's something I should be keeping an eye out on as well, because maybe advising so many students and I feel like I've done my part and then I don't see the other side of it, right? And uh, I think that gives me a, a little bit of thinking to do, right? In terms of how should I be approaching this? And I feel like opening up your office to more and more conversations giving them that comfortability to be able to come knock on your door and say that, hey, Dr. Patel, do you have a moment? I'd like to share this idea with you. It doesn't have to be about anything. This yeah. idea came up to me. Maybe creating that form of acceptance that, hey, you know, your thoughts, your ideas matter. And yeah. I think it starts from the faculty point of view because I remember being an undergrad, I was scared of reaching out to a faculty member. And maybe in my case, I need to open up doors in terms of hosting, uh, a tea, because I don't drink coffee, a, <laughs> a, t a tea moment at Starbucks and said, hey, why don't you come meet me out here and bring your friends along as well? Yeah, the, the, those, you know, these are small differences. One thing that I advocate for is having uh, Starbucks or coffee, uh, coffee hours. And that's the whole idea of where Coffee with Dr. A came from. It's how do we break these uh, barriers where in an academic environment, um, the, the barriers are pretty high for a student to knock on your door. First of all, come to your office at the designated time, knock on it, and then come into your space. And the term office hours, and there's a lot of academic research about um, you know, the need to change the term office hours uh, to something that is a little bit more, uh, makes it more approachable for students to, to reach out. But yeah, I don't know why we don't take those conversations outside of the office and, you know, use campus as a, as a platform. Uh, students, I think, sometimes want to see you in their, in their environment as well. You know, and that will make it much easier for them to engage with you. Um, I, there's always a question I ask in my class, and I don't feel like I'm intimidating, but I ask my students, do I look intimidating to you? And you'd be surprised. Yeah. You'd be surprised. A lot of students what, what's think, the answer there? Yeah, well, you know, you don't get an overwhelming uh, response from students in terms of them wanting to speak out. But you could hear some buzz and you could see a shakes of head saying that, yeah, it, it's yeah. a challenge to come and come and just talk to you. And I think that when you try to be professional in a classroom, mm -hmm. it's sometimes even if you have stories and jokes to to engage with students, it still doesn't translate in terms of, OK, this, yeah. this faculty member, this teacher is easy to approach. That's true. And, 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 and this is a great uh, segue to, I think the audience needs to know what's the environment that you teach in. So you're, you're a, lecturer at, a senior lecturer at the University of Kentucky. What does that mean? All right, so as a faculty member, I have a class load of say, four four teaching load, but however, I get course releases because I'm also a director of undergraduate studies. We have around uh, 600 to 700 majors that I oversee. I don't typically wow. get to see all those students because we have professional advisors. 
However, our majors are broken into four different segments, such as uh, we have the economics in the College of Business, we have economics in the arts and science, then we have mathematical economics, and then we have foreign language and international economics. Uh, okay. Overall, you know, whenever students need an idea or advice in terms of how to move along with the career path, academic career, I step in and advise. Otherwise, they tend to take um, help from our academic advisors. On the teaching end, I teach large lectures of principles of microeconomics. So this large lecture of principle of microeconomics consists of in, in a regular semester around 450 to 480 students. Okay. And then- That's uh, pretty large. It's, it's pretty daunting, right? Initially, I always thought, going back to that more comment I'd made earlier um, about how I came to United States as a very shy student. I could not speak in, in groups, let yeah. alone uh, a classroom because I still- and now you're teaching 480 people at, at, at once. At once, uh, and I never thought my, I would ever see myself standing in front of such a large crowd, uh, engaging with such a large crowd, but it's been a really fun journey and I'm really, really enjoying it. So, so I've had the opportunity to watch you teach in that large, uh, large lecture. And, um, you know, I, I will tell you this, you have complete command of that classroom from the moment that you walk in, um, you, you lecture, you develop a uh, community. You have a really good talent of developing community in your, in your large lectures, but what's, so it's not something that anybody could do just starting tomorrow, for instance, if they've never done it. So what are your tips for, you know, graduate students in economics that might want to go teach large lecture environments, um, how to develop that skill set and what are the things that they need to keep in mind? All right. So I think initially you always have to have a support system. Uh, okay. My support system came from, you know, my colleagues, you, uh, the econ ed community, uh, great advisors, uh, Dr. Gail Hoyt, who is uh, my colleague now, uh, you learned a lot from them, learned to be effective teachers, even in a class, small classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, two, I think about being organized with a large group of students. You don't want it to get carried away in a different direction, the wrong direction, such that you get overwhelmed with lots of emails. So you have to be organized yourself. Yeah, it, it, it would get really, really interesting if you confuse a group of students with even five minutes of lecture. Yeah. And then you've just lost your whole control of the whole classroom. But your credibility is gone. And, and just one exactly. sentence could ruin the entire credibility. Um, exactly. Yeah. And so having the confidence to even to correct yourself, mm -hmm. it should be there. Um, other, other techniques I would like to use is finding ways to make the classroom feel small. What's an example of uh, a way to make the classroom feel smaller? All right, so one of the techniques I like to use is I like to play music before class starts. And the okay. music videos I like to choose are created by my students through an extra credit project. And you've, you've hosted one, it's called Econ Beats, and uh, where students take uh, any music video that they like, they script all, script all the lyrics, write economic lyrics, record themselves, and then uh, produce it. Uh, so when it's to teach a certain class, it's taxation. I'll play a music video that students have used to talk about taxation. And at the same time, I'll walk around saying hi to students, talking to them, and I'll do this, I'll say hi to different students all the time so that I could get to know more students and make them feel welcome in the class. Uh, you will see that the attention span increases, they're more likely to answer questions, and you're trying to give a voice to more and more students within your, your class. And, and you know, all, all the studies indicate that classroom management and, uh, you know, community development is really important for uh, learning and, and retention. Um, so investing in these small things that they're really small to you, playing music and walking around and just saying hi, uh, you know, the cost of that isn't isn't much, uh, but the returns are extremely high. So kudos to you for for doing that. Thank you. Yeah. So how do you one thing uh, my my largest class is 120 students and uh, I rarely teach those anymore. How do you manage emails and um, you know student questions? So again, goes back to the original point, being organized. Um, I start off making sure that the syllabus 
is pretty well organized, structured, and with that, our learning management system, our course shells, or which we use as Canvas, is also well structured, such that students have a way to map out this semester. Yeah. If you are very late in uh, scheduling homework, scheduling due dates, making errors in those due dates, yeah. you're going to continuously see student complaints or student emails and you'll never able to get hold of the class and i think that goes on with small classes as well if you if you, in yeah. your experience my, my experience and especially with the transition online it's even more important i actually often think about some of the comments that you make about organization because when when you're teaching in person in a small class you could walk in and speak off the cuff and change due dates if, if you'd like right because it's a small community you could decide on on what's best uh, but in an online community or large lectures, a due date is a due date. And, you know, I'm I'm always an advocate for not changing due dates. Uh, no matter what happens, I will drop a grade rather than say, hey, let's move it. Um, but um, organization is key in, in this online environment. So and I, I hear and your I, words often. And I think that just moving forward on top of that, it's, it's okay to own up a mistake, you know? We, we're humans, so we make mistakes, we make errors. But you know what you do? You do not punish your students for that. Yeah. So what I do? I give them full points for anything that I might have caused them any anxiety. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, th this, is, this brings me to something that's really been stressing me out a lot lately. Um, and it's this whole how do we assess students in the online environment? If, if you've seen my tweets, you've seen me complain about, you know, some, some companies out there that um, really add more stress to, to, uh, to the testing environment by requiring multiple proctors, showing all the students, uh, you know, they have to show their entire environment. And, you know, I, I'm not going to get your opinion unless you want to share it, but... But the thing around tests is the anxiety is super high. It is extremely high. No matter what you try to do, it's, it's going to be high. So think about ways to um, minimize that. So, um, so yeah, just, I just wanted to point out that students in today's world, especially in this online environment, are extremely anxious around exams, and we need to do a better job of uh, mitigating that. 100% agree, and I think... Uh... I'm, I'm struggling with that as well. When you think about teaching over 400 students in a class, and since we went remote this fall 2020, I have around 560 students. So the number actually increased because there's no physical constraint in terms of how many students could join your class. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because uh, administration think that the marginal cost of adding a student is zero. However, they're very wrong. Yeah. Uh, and just being in that classroom, if they had to put their themselves in the classroom, they would realize that every additional student you add in, uh, it, it's actually increasing a lot of workload on the faculty member. And so I'm really struggling in terms of, okay, I've got 560 students. How do I minimize cheating? Yeah. And, and I do agree with you that certain, um, certain uh, response way systems like ProctorU, I'm going to name it, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, does, does cause a lot of anxiety because now you're having individuals who are looking in, yeah. who are not part of the academic field. And then it brings me that idea when I responded to one of your tweets in terms of, all right, so our academics is very focused on FERPA. And then why are they not really enforcing that when it comes to certain types of um, test taking proctoring services? Yeah, I mean, th that's one issue. The other issue that I have with this is I, I spend a lot of time on developing uh, community in my classrooms and um, relationships that are, um, you know, that develop students' uh, growth mindset. And I feel like outsourcing that proctoring aspect to an entity that is not part of the same community breaks that trust with the student. And that's where my issue is. I mean, I've heard horror stories. I could share them. Um, but, you know, the, the point being is, uh, you know, even when you have TAs, right? Let's say you have TAs as part of your community. You're working with your TAs to have that same culture with your students that you have. 
Uh, but with these outsized outsourced um, assessment or um, oversight companies, they really have no incentive to invest in that culture development. So it just gets a little contentious, and that's something that you know I'm 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 talking about a lot lately. No, it's so, a sensitive it's a sensitive topic, and I think it's supposed to be talked about, and it's supposed to be shared, and a conversation needs to happen on it. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we've talked a lot about your teaching. You, you have a great teaching record. You've won all these uh, amazing awards, and they're all, um, you know, you deserve these uh, this recognition. Uh, one area, as a senior lecturer, you probably, you know, don't get evaluated on your research output, but you're a great researcher. You've uh, published a lot. In fact, I think out of um, all my co-authors, you and I have published the most together quiz for you because I don't know the answer to this. How many papers have we published together? Uh, I have no <laughs> idea. I have absolutely no right. idea. <laughs> I'm going to look up that number and then I'll include it. Although, here, but although it's going to be easy because, you know, the way we put it on our CV is always based on the last name. Yeah, uh, so all you have to do on your CV is look at how many Alvaranis you see. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I get first, uh, first recognition on that, on the citation. Um, but one thing that I like, um, and you know, I, I have amazing co-authors. I love working with all of them. But the thing about the work with you is, um, we we have really found a system. And you know, I, I listen to all these podcasts about academic, um, you know, research and how to organize your workflow. Um, and lately, I've been trying to think about how do we advise people on how to approach uh, the research output. Now, you and I have produced research in economics uh, or economic education, and then also in financial literacy and household finance. So this is both discipline and pedagogy research. What is your advice on the research process? So I'll talk about from my perspective, and it's very different for everybody. I think uh, everybody likes to approach it in their own unique way. But I think what really helps me is to have that strong support system. Again, going back from the students, being colleagues, and then being researchers, and being able to find that group of individuals who have the same level of uh, passion in that same area, and being able to bounce off ideas, even if they're not going to be your co-authors in some areas, in some areas they are, but having that group of people who are going to bounce ideas with you and help you through every stage and help you proofread papers, um, be there for your presentations, give feedback. I think that, that, that has to play a big major role. But having that support system where you are there and Aziz was there, you know, we've got other colleagues like Brandon, Sheridan, James Sonoris, Sarah, Emily. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's a great community that I was lucky to be part of. And because I was part of this community that's willing to help each other, support each other, uh, I think it really helped me get confident and be able to do well in my my research. And I, I want to do a shameless plug. You know, I do work for University of Kentucky. Uh, mm -hmm. absolutely love it up here. But for any graduate students or potential graduate students who are looking to find a place to do a PhD in economics, I think you should really consider University of Kentucky, the economics department. It's a wonderful place to be. Uh, our colleagues, my colleagues now, uh, are a really great set of researchers, really care about their students and are very great mentors. And, it, and, and something about University of Kentucky and Abdullah, you can, you can definitely uh, comment on this, that we are lucky to be part of this community that really helped us develop ourselves, not just as economists, but also our personality that we could go and bring it into a classroom or in any professional setting as well. Uh, yeah, the, you know, we're, we're not, I'm not being paid by the University of Kentucky to to, to say this, but uh, I owe a lot of my uh, career to the community um, that is developed around the econ department at the University of Kentucky. Uh, my co-authors, my mentors, my, my colleagues, uh, most of them have a UK connection. And um, it, uh, you know, I had fun in grad school. Uh, was it stressful at times? Yeah. Were there stresses about finding a job? I graduated, you know, in 2010 when, you know, jobs were, um, you know, there was a lack of jobs due to the Great Recession. And um, 
but we we had fun in, in in the process and i think we had a good balance there and um so yes shout out if you're looking for a good graduate program go to the university of kentucky um and especially for the international students that are um watching this um you know lexington kentucky is a great place um for, from a diversity standpoint as well you'll get everything that you need here and it's a small enough place that you don't get lost in it so shout out absolutely. to the uk absolutely and i'll be very happy to work with anybody when it comes to teaching as well all right so there you go if you have questions reach out to dr patel um so i, I had a i have a question that i'm not sure i am 100 percent ready to talk about it um but let's go there. So how many times do you get mistaken for me? Boy, you know, it's hard to count now. And, and yeah. it's, it's, it's getting out of, it's getting out of hand now. <laughs> so, so what do you think? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I did put you on the spot there. So, so one thing, and this is, this goes back to being an international student and navigating the culture. One thing that has come up uh, a lot lately, and it might seem like it's a simple mistake, but the fact that it happens often is starting to become a little bit um, overwhelming for my career. And I'll tell you in a minute what, why that's the case. But often I get mistaken for Darshak Patel, right? And I don't think we look alike. We've written a lot together, um, but it, it's had, it has impacted uh, my career. And I have never told you this before, um, so this is the first time I'm I'm sharing this. There was a point about three years ago where I was like, okay, we're getting mistaken a lot. Maybe it's because we write together so so much. So a part of me was like, hey, how about we reduce co-authorship? And I never shared this with you. I just thought about it and um, stop writing so much with Darshak Patel so people don't mistake us. And I just got done telling you this that you know we have great co-authorship environment. So I hindered my own career by slowing down because society can't tell us apart. Now, that has obviously personal repercussions, but also career repercussions. Do you, does this resonate any with you? So yeah, so where I was going to add on this is, and I'm sorry, um, you know, you you had to go through that alone, and I wish you had talked to me a little bit about it three years ago. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I think initially it was all jokes, mm -hmm. right? You know, when you're close with friends and uh, colleagues, mentors, and they, they, make, they make those errors, you know, we can shrug that off and say that's that's jokes, but I think when it gets to your professional career, your level, it really dilutes your success. And I think that's where I have an issue with, right? I'll give you a couple of examples, right? One, I think this is for in your scenario. When did you get tenure? I think it was, gosh, I 2017. Yeah. All right. All right. So typically you and I have gone to most conferences together. Yeah. Right, we've presented a lot of our papers, so we're there to support each other. There's this one conference I went, you just recognized tenure on social media, mm -hmm. I guess you presented that. Uh, I, was, I was at a conference, you are on there. I was waiting for the next session to start, and this individual faculty member from another school came in and said, congratulations on your tenure. Mm -hmm. And I really think it took away some light from your success. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think that annoyed me a lot. Uh, first, you do not know who exactly I am. Yeah. And second, then basically, you probably don't consider me highly valued in the academic, in the economics uh, discipline. To, to remember who you are, right? Yeah. And, yeah. So that, and, and that's how I look at it. It's, you know, there's, we, we all make mistakes. I've accidentally called people by a different, uh, different name, um, memory lapses. But this is systemic. It happens often. It might not be the same people, but it's happening over and over. And it's at the point where I feel like it is marginalizing my career, and it's also marginalizing your career. We've worked so hard to be um, identified in our niche area, and now people can't tell us apart. Um, and as I said, it's not because we look the same. 
I, I don't think we look alike. If, if you're watching this and you think we look alike, please tell us. Uh, but yes. <laughs> I, I'm at the point now, like, how do we, is, is it on us to correct it? Or how do we correct it? Because at the same time, and, and this is the issue uh, that I have is when somebody mistakes me, for, for you, I don't know how to politely correct, or I feel like correcting them is not polite. Um, so I just get, you know, aggravated and I move on, but I've never really corrected the issue. I, I really feel it's up on uh, our colleagues to figure that out. And yeah. uh, one thing I've done is taken this as a teaching moment. And uh, three years ago, I asked my students as an extra credit question on the exam, my large class, to spell out my name just to see how many students are even paying attention. This was the second exam. So it was probably seven and a half yeah. weeks into the semester. So they should have plenty of time. They see my name, they see my emails coming all the time. Yeah. They should have had it, right? You'd be surprised around 30 to 35% could not spell my name. And I could show you, we could go yeah. through a PowerPoint and show you all the different ways they are spelled out my name. I mean, it's it's one of the reasons why I go by Dr. A, you know, it's to, to make it easier for the students. But so I, I understand exactly where you're coming from. And 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 hopefully, uh, friends, colleagues, if you're if you're watching this, um, I'll, I'll actually make sure our names are on, on the screen. Um, but yes, so that's that's one thing. Um, and, you know, and, and, and the reason I bring it up is economics is going through. Uh, a reckoning within themselves about diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and this is one of the you know examples that I personally could relate to about you know you, we have the diversity, we've got the numbers um, in this situation, um, we're included, but I don't necessarily feel like I belong if my colleagues are not remembering who I am um, and, and are mistaking me. So. This is this is maybe a little bit deeper than um, I had intended to go, I think, but I appreciate you talking about it. I think what? Yeah. So you know, let, let's let's move on to um, a little bit more of uh, your personal um, experiences because one thing that people don't realize, and this is for my students and my friends and colleagues and outside of academia, is professors have uh, an identity outside of um, uh, academia. You love hiking. You've tried to convince me to go hiking. Uh, I might do a hike one day, but till I do the hike, what is your favorite hike that you have done? Good question, and I'll get and, to the point. Do you point. have pictures of it? I do have pictures, and right. I will share Send them. Send them, and I'll, I'll I'll put them on the on the clip as well. Definitely, but I think just to add to that point about having an identity, mm -hmm. when I talk about making a classroom small. I think my it's important to let my students know I have an identity and I mm -hmm. tend to share those identities within my classroom. I use them as examples, use them as pictures of my PowerPoint slides and I engage with them in social media to show them that, hey, look, I am part of you. And yes. I have activities, I do things that you do as well to kind of open up the doors a little bit, right? And I do love hiking. And one day I will love to take you hiking. And I think my favorite favorite hike so far, and I was very fortunate to do this last summer, take a group of colleagues from University of Kentucky and their friends to Mount Kilimanjaro. And uh, we were able to hike that over seven days. And... Wow. Uh, it was an amazing feeling to summit the highest stand, single highest standing mountain in the world. Um, and so seven days, and how many of you went? Uh, we were for the for the hike itself. We were nine of us, and uh, it was a huge uh, contingent from University of Kentucky or Kentucky itself. Yeah. And it was five nights, five and a half nights climbing, hiking all the way up to the summit, and then one and a half days uh, coming down to that, the starting that, point. <laughs> that sounds amazing. And then after the hike, you, you all did a safari, correct? Right. So, you know, like I mentioned before, I was born and raised in Kenya, and it was a great pleasure to take uh, the nine of, uh, so out of the nine, 
Safari and then three others joined us straight from uh, US to the Safari. It was nice to show people or my friends where I grew up and then my favorite, favorite vacation in the whole world of going for a safari in Masai Mara and showing them all the big cats that I like to go look, look at. And I hope to get you there as well one day. That, that sounds amazing. <laughs> Actually, I just had a former student of mine that is, um, that I taught when I was a TA at the University of Kentucky reached out to me yesterday via Instagram and he's currently in Kenya and he was doing a tour and they talked about, um, the relationship be between Kenya and Oman. And he was fact checking. He was sending me messages saying, Hey, they just said this, is this true? And he, after the tour said that they talked about Oman so much that he wants uh, to next go to Oman. So you've been to Oman. It, it was uh, great to host you. I think it was 2014, right? It's been a while. Yes. So and now it's on me to make sure I make it to Kenya. Let's uh, let's make sure we plan that after this whole COVID pandemic well, uh, is behind let, us. Let me tell you that visiting Oman was also a great, great time. And thank you for hosting me. And uh, anybody who wants to go to Oman, make sure Abdullah's there because he, he'll show you a good time. <laughs> as Omanis, we, we welcome everybody. So yes, we, we would love to have anybody. One of my goals is to actually have a mini econ conference in Oman to, to kind of balance a, a bit of the academics and then do kind of a cultural uh, awareness. But uh, we'll plan that after things settle down in the world. And, and then hike after that, right? Uh, sure. We'll, we'll go on a hike. <laughs> no, that's that's actually one of my goals, you know, and, and, and the current um, health environment, pandemic environment, um, you know, makes allows you to start thinking about spending more time outdoors. Um, so I'm, I'm right. thinking about getting into hiking. You know, but, just just talking about that, right? I think uh, when you, you when I told talk to you about how how much I like hiking, uh, I tend to go hiking a lot by myself with my my companion Tusker, and I'll send you a picture <laughs> of Tusker as well because you have to share um, that. Everybody has to know Tusker by now, but if you don't, Tusker is the best <laughs> dog ever. <laughs> yes, and uh, when I got him, Abdullah told me this dog's going to be big, and I'm like, no, 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 it's going to be a small dog, and yeah. and you'll see the picture of him. But you know. I think about hiking as my reset button, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with, with social media, with your phones, with, with being on the computer constantly, your brain working again and again, and again, you need something to reset. Right. And so for me, yeah, hiking, right. hiking is a reset button. And I know hiking isn't your forte yet. And maybe it may end up. Well, becoming... I don't know. I, I have no idea. I've never done it. Right. <laughs> What's your reset button? What's right your now? reset button? So it's something that I picked up in, in grad school and I, I try to get back to it whenever I feel like things, you know, are getting overwhelming and that's photography. So I just take the camera, go out and it's just me and nature. So, you know, the, the thing that I'm going to trick myself into is say I'm going on a photography walk. Uh, with you, and it just turns out into to be a hike. So Perfect. this way we get the, the best of both worlds. Um, before we leave today, uh, there's one thing that I like to ask people, and that's what's keeping you busy or you know engaged right now, and kind of what's your biggest project? So right now, the challenge is because of where we are. Uh, fall 2020, uh, the pandemic's going on. The challenge is trying to figure out the best way to approach teaching remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's very tiring to be always in front of a computer, uh, to be teaching, engaging students to us through a screen. Uh, because I, I have been, I've been used to teaching a large lecture. The reason why I, I feel I can uh, have a great setup with my students, a great relationship with my students because I build off their energy. Mm -hmm. I build off the energy that I see from my students while I'm engaging with them. And so just trying to figure out what's the best route, how to translate what I used to do from a face-to-face -face lecture to a remote setting, I think it's taking up a lot of my time. That's one. Second, trying to advise students um, on how to navigate this particular period of time in their life, especially those who are close to graduating, without with all this uncertainty coming in, in terms of, okay, when can we get back to work? And when can normalcy come into play, right? Yeah. So those are 
those are from the academic side point of keeping me really busy. Uh, on the other hand, trying to work on a couple of projects, uh, you and I have a couple of um, projects that we need to complete, a couple of book chapters that we need to work on. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> we need to get to work. <laughs> we need to get to work, but, but you know, those are the few things. And, uh, you know, I just recently became a U.S. citizen. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. And now when I have my passport, you know, my dream was always to travel to places where I do not have to now go get visas. Yeah. So now I'm dreaming about where I can go. <laughs> about when, when airports open up again and travel is, uh, is free again. Exactly. Well, well, congratulations. <laughs> and, um, you know, um, th there's one thing about the student engagement that um, I'd like to highlight, and that's uh, the e-com games. We forgot to talk about that. So you're you're organizing. We're both organizing together the econ games. Uh, for for the people that are not familiar with the econ games is, and for especially the students, um, how would you describe the econ games and what's the what's the benefit of it? All right. So whenever I have to talk about econ games, I like to use the term internship for a day or okay. interning for I a like day. That. Uh, it, it, it's a perfect way to describe what our students actually get to experience. Uh, the way we tend to do this, and Abdullah and I did this, uh, it's just NKU, Northern Kentucky University and University of Kentucky a year ago. Uh, and then we had another competition lined up this past March, but it failed and we had around six or seven schools participating with their students. But the goal is to have a groups of students of four or five uh, work on a real world problem. And how do we find this real world problem? We try and get a company. Uh, in this case, we worked with 8451, which is a data analytic company or a, a portion of the De Kroger uh, Limited. Marketing research. Uh, yeah, it's a marketing research portion of it. And uh, what we did was we asked them, hey, would you be willing to provide a data set that you and your employees are using right now to come up with or somewhat creating value for your company and analyzing it and so on, um, analyzing the data and so on. And would you give this data set to our students to analyze it, uh, work with it, come up with some form of presentation and present it to you? And so that's what Econ Games are about, giving them a real world experience. And they get one day to work on this data set. So they never get to they never get to see this data set beforehand. We have this one day event where the corporate company comes in, uh, talk about all the opportunities students can have within uh, the organization. Then boom, they release this data set where students go into their groups, have six hours to analyze it, clean the data, data set, come up with a presentation and show the company 8451 in this case, how they're creating value for them. And then they get judged upon that overall the same students could be getting that experience over a three month internship at this organization. And hence, I like to call it interning for a day. Interning. And, and the thing that I love about it is it gives students an idea of what they could do with their career. If, uh, if you advise students in economics, uh, the question that you'll hear often from the students and their parents is what can you do with this degree? Um, and, and this gives them the idea. And we've, we've had students from first year to fourth, actually we've had graduate students participate as well. Um, and, and it opens up their eyes to what an econ degree can do, but most importantly, also tells employers what econ degrees uh, can do. So I'm excited. We're organizing the econ games. I will link to that in the, in the description um, of this um, video. If you're interested in participating as a faculty member or as a student, uh, please fill out the form and uh, we'll update you because we have some great news that we're going to release here, I think, December or early January about uh, the spring uh, econ games. Um, it's going to be a, a good one. It's going to be virtual. So anybody that wants to participate is uh, welcome. So Darshak, I really appreciate you joining me for a cup of coffee today. I, I hope you enjoyed this experience. And for the people, uh, well, your cup of water, sorry. Yes. For, 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 for people that want to get in touch with you, I'm going to include your Twitter handle, Instagram handle, and um, your email address on here, if that's okay with you. Perfect. All right. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks for being here. Um, and hopefully I'll see you soon. All right. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure uh, conversing with you. Thank All you. All right, Darshan. <laughs> see you, man. See. Take care. Bye.